how to teach Git. I'm Georgia Ray, so I'm definitely in the right place. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so does everybody here know Git? Like, yes. not all of the like weird little stuff, but like the beginner stuff. Yes. Cool. All right. Um, do you need to teach someone else Git? Yes. Office. Okay. Cool. Is are you teaching beginners? Okay, uh, cool. So I'm only gonna sort of walk you through um, how to teach to beginners. So people that have like never seen it before and just sort of like help you avoid the potholes that they're gonna run into. I can't really make them go away because it's Git. Um, <laughs> but I can at least warn you so you know that they're there. Um, this is not meant to help you like understand Git on a deeper level um, and it's not to teach other people how to understand it on a deeper level. Um, also, I'm not giving you a curriculum. I don't uh, know who you're teaching or how many people you're teaching or what their experience with Bash and other stuff is, so I can't really give you a curriculum or a tutorial because there's already a bunch of those. Just pick one. Um, so I'm just telling you how to teach beginners and preparing you for like weird stuff I've run into and seen other people run into. Um, okay. Scroll. How does, I guess we should have figured this out sooner. Does that do what I think it does? It does. Awesome, okay. Uh, so step one, the easiest way to avoid a lot of the confusion later on is to like make sure that your beginner actually knows like what problem they're solving. So if you just say this is Git, it's version control, whatever that means, um, you're gonna need it, then <laughs> it's gonna be really confusing later on why you're talking about graph theory. Um, <laughs> So start by explaining in the context of writing code and writing code with others and make up some scenarios that are not related to code as to why they would need to be able to get back to like previous versions and why they need to be able to uh, store changes in a way that aren't going to be inflicted on others. Um, I like to say that Git protects you and others from yourself and others because you can screw up and it's there to protect you, and you can screw up, and other people don't have to suffer through the consequences of what you did. Um, right. Uh, also, Git has the really unfortunate um, problem that a lot of the words don't really mean anything. Yes. <laughs> yeah, or they don't mean what they colloquially mean yeah. to most people. So commit is probably the worst one. Remote's pretty bad too. Um, but yeah, so really, really explain all of this because when you get to the point where you're saying like, we're committing to these changes, it'll make a lot more sense if they already have some idea of what the environment that they're working in is. Um, so another thing, really keep in mind like what you're trying to teach beginners. They're not gonna learn all of Git, and it might be hard to remember this, but like, there's only so much you can learn at a time. So we're teaching them how to drive, not how an engine works. Yes. So not a good time to talk about file systems. Like they, they know the basics, awesome, but not a good time to say like, this is really how Git is keeping track of everything. And uh, I'll get into the rest later. Um, so yeah, don't get sidetracked by talking about like the cool thing that you think Git does. It's like, oh yeah, I love this feature. If you didn't need it for the first two years, don't tell them. Just ignore that for now. Um, all right, so next up. So this is one of my major pet peeves about Git and actually coding in general, is we have this tendency to sort of teach incantations where it's like, if you slaughter the goat and say these magic words on this day and whatever else, everything will go fine. And if you miss any steps along the way, you're just screwed. Like there's no way to, like I can't prepare you for every way that it's gonna go wrong. So one of the worst <coughs> things we do is we just give them this like set of steps and say just do this, just memorize this, everything will be fine right up until it isn't. Um, so right from the beginning, explain what your words mean and explain them in the context of like why do we have to wrap everything up into these discrete save points? Because that way they're not just memorizing things. Um, so I learned this, I learned Git in the worst possible way. I literally had a sheet of paper that said Git status, Git add, files, Git commit dash M something, Git push. So somebody set up a repo for me, or maybe I did it, with like Git in it and like set up stream and all of that. 
and I had no record of that or any idea where it was. And I was using that piece of paper for like the first year and a half that I was using Git. And I was, con and I was contributing to other projects. So that's terrifying. I had no idea how to, I didn't know what Git log was. Oh. Like that's terrible. You should know what that is. <laughs> um, so yeah, everything on the right is some words that uh, they definitely don't know what it means. And they might try to guess and they'll probably be wrong. And you need to be able to explain those. Um, yeah, okay, so one of the easier ways to sort of build up a context for them and avoid Git incantations is A, explain what all the words mean ahead of time. But a lot of times, uh, I'm a little bit biased towards metaphors because I'm kind of good at them. Uh, but it definitely matters which ones you use. Uh, some of them are not very good. <laughs> so I ran through this talk like a week ago with Thursday Bram and she was like, you need to talk about like how to come up with like good metaphors and I was like, I don't know, I'm just, I haven't really thought about what makes them good or bad. She's written an article on it, it's in the recompiler, I'm not going to go over it now because it already exists. Um, so yeah, definitely. Spend some time thinking about your metaphors. And another problem is if it's not making sense to someone, don't be married or committed to uh, the metaphors that you're using. Really try to pick ones that they would already know. So comparing it to other stuff in graph theory is probably not going to help if they're a beginner. All right, so that's most of the overarching stuff. If you can give them some context ahead of time, if you can just be very mindful about when you use your terminology, we can get into some of the weird potholes now. Uh, so let's start by talking about the local workflow, which is obviously where you're going to start. Um, so I, uh, sorry to show you code. I tried to highlight the important bits. Um, I know it's kind of gross looking. Uh, so explaining what init is short for is something that I see get overlooked kind of a lot, um, which is a problem because it sounds like a word. Uh, but definitely make sure that you say the word initialize. Um, and if you know that your beginner definitely has enough bash knowledge to know what ls-la does, then I think it's actually pretty helpful to say like, this is what it looked like before, I did get in it, this is what changed, everything Git knows is right here, and it knows what's in this folder, and it knows what's in its subfolders, and the rest of the computer doesn't exist. Um, but if they don't already know what ls-la does, then you're just gonna get sidetracked, that's gonna be confusing, just come up with a way to explain that without showing the actual thing. All right, um, so the staging area. Uh, <laughs> this is how it's usually taught, or this is a lot of the times how you see people introducing it, is they just like walk them through the steps. Um, I think it is really important to teach this workflow and really hammered in, it's like status add commit, status add commit. Uh, noticeably absent, push, I'll get back to that later. Um, but I don't think this is the most helpful way to understand it. Um, the best way is probably pictures. Yay. Um, and what's even better than pictures is arrows. <laughs> um, so I tried to make this match some of the wording that you would normally see in status. Uh, and honestly, I really hate the words working directory, staging area, and repository. But you have to teach them. They're going to run into it. They're going to see it. Everybody is going to use those words. It's going to be in all the documentation. So again, explain that working directory is the directory that they must already know from their limited bash knowledge, staging area is Git trying to keep track of what you're doing and you saying, I'm gonna put stuff here and I want you to keep track of these changes. Uh, and then, I don't mean repository, um, whatever. I hate that word. Uh, so, oh, I meant to say this in the in its slide. Uh, you do have to explain what repository means. It doesn't mean folder have fun with that, it kind of depends on what you think they're going to be using it for, if they're just gonna be doing their own personal project on GitHub, or if you're working on a big project with them, like how you explain repository will be a little bit different, so have fun with that. Um, but don't <laughs> teach it as a synonym for folder, um, unless they are very, very beginner, in which case, sure, go for it. Um, so yeah, teach this process, show what things move and when, and show them that status is gonna keep track of stuff for them. Um, status is one of the tools that we're really good about teaching, uh, but I'm probably gonna harp on this again. 
it's perfect. It doesn't change anything. It just tells you information. So there's never a time when you can't use status. If like between any two steps, you just did a git init, cool, do status. You're not sure if this is a repo, do status. You added or removed something or you have no idea what you did, just do status or just check to make sure that you're not accidentally keeping track of like the .pyc files. Um, don't teach .git ignore on the first day in, like, unless you have to. Um, so yeah, git status is perfect. It doesn't change anything. Um, but also you wanna walk them through this and show them like what does untracked file means. It, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so talk about what it means for a file to be modified, uh, what it means to add the modifications to, oh, I'm not getting on the next slide now. Uh, so yeah, really w try to come up with as many different things that status can show you uh, and make sure that they see as many of them as possible because just being able to like parse through that is really helpful. And getting them used to seeing like this is how your computer is going to give you information is gonna be helpful. Oh, eh, we'll get to that later. All right, uh, so I have this periodically throughout. Uh, the stuff in bold is just, a lot of times we have a tendency, this is the git incantations. We have a tendency to just say that when what we really mean is that sentence afterwards. So I'm not going to read through all of those, but these are some examples of ways you can explain it. Again, it'll sort of change depending on your particular case, but these are usually okay. Um, but with git add, one thing I've noticed is a lot of people seem to think it means start tracking this file, which the first time it does, but then every time after that it means I care about the changes in this file and they need to be, uh, I need to keep track of them along with everything else or I need them to be saved together with the rest of this stuff that we're saving at the same time. Um, so make sure that you explain that, that it doesn't just mean from now on I want you to automatically make sure that you save all of the changes to this file. Um, also, I don't think it's helpful to teach git rm and git move on day one. If you can, pick a project where you won't run into that. Uh, again, there's just a lot of material they're gonna gain all at once. And what add does is fairly straightforward, but what rm and move are doing is a little bit more confusing because you're saying, I want to add these changes, but I want to add a change that's to say stop keeping track of this thing. That can be really confusing early on. So I think that's a really good thing to like tackle a couple weeks in or maybe just the next day, but not on day one because they're gonna be absorbing a lot of information. Okay. Um, so what is a commit? This is one of the more annoying ones because I have seen so many people just start saying we need to commit these changes and we need to put these changes in a commit uh, and just using them as verbs and nouns interchangeably, which gets real confusing real fast. Um, so this is one where I think it is very, very important that you use synonyms to explain what it, the terminology means before you start giving instructions. With some of the other ones, like add, it's pretty obvious. But uh, with commit especially, this word means nothing. The colloquial meaning has nothing to do with what it means in terms of git. I mean, it kind of does, but not really. So take some time and make sure that they understand this, because this is kind of the heart of git, is these discrete save points. Um, and definitely talk about why you would want to save a bunch of changes from different files together. Uh, yeah, talk about that. If they're new to code, I would recommend trying to pick an example that isn't code related. If they're not new to code, then you just say like, this is like all the files that this feature touches. Um, I personally really like using the example of like, oh, you wrote a book that's based on Twilight and you used all of the original characters' names. Well, we need to control find Bella and <laughs> replace it with Anastasia in all of the files. That's an example of a time when you would need to keep all of these changes together. Nice. Um, so again, maybe depending on your audience. Wouldn't use that one at work. Uh, oh yeah, uh, so always use git commit dash m. That's one of those things that we all know. I'm in, in general in favor of using as few of the arguments, the little dash arguments, uh, when teaching to beginners, because those tend to look more incantation-y, but this one matters. Um, and I think this is a really great time to just sort of segue into like, we need to talk about documentation and like make sure that they're paying attention to that from the beginning. Um, 
normally I'd say don't get sidetracked, but that's an important one. Um, also, make sure they just think of commit-m as the entire command, because if you don't do it, this is a really confusing thing to run into, especially because, at least on my machine, the uh, default editor is v. <laughs> so it's going to open, the little blue box is uh, what's in v. So it's going to open that up and say, like, I need you to do something, and I know how to move into insert mode and add a message and close this, uh, but not everyone else will. Um, and then even after I close it, it gives me this error, and it's just like, I'm sorry, I give up, I don't know what you want. So I've never figured that out, and I don't care to fix it. So make sure they know to always use dash m. Okay, uh, this is just like one single point, but I felt like it needed its own slide. Remember how I said earlier, if you teach the workflow with push, like I specifically leave it out? Um, I have definitely seen a lot of people think commit and push are the same thing. Uh, so if you always do status add commit push, status add commit push, it can seem as though commit is the same command if you're not really explaining the step between those or to check between them. Or it can seem like it's just like the wrapping up to push to a remote repo. Um, and I think some of the tutorials online, specifically the ones like GitHub, where they're expecting you to use GitHub, they teach it as if that is the purpose of commit, is just to make it possible to push to another place. Um, and I don't think that's helpful. <laughs> um, but that's a really weird confusion that I definitely did not see coming until I had to explain it after they were already very confused about that. So look out for that one. And the easiest way I know to separate those is to teach git log in between commit and push. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said earlier, I was using git for like a year and a half before I knew git log existed. So I was aware that all of this stuff existed somewhere and I didn't know how to access it. And I didn't really know how to read man pages yet. So teaching git log on the first day is really important because kind of the whole fucking point of git was that you could find this stuff. <laughs> and this is how you find it. Um, I didn't mean to swear. Uh, anyway, this is very frustrating for me, because seriously, like over a year, just being like, I know this exists somewhere, but I usually just went back and edited the files. Uh, it's terrible. Um, but yeah, this is a really good step to show them. Again, it doesn't change anything. It just gives you information. So do it all the time, even if nothing changes. So that way they know that add doesn't do anything. Commit does change the history. Um, and especially when you get into branching, which we'll talk about later, this is really important because I think understanding like what the branch is keeping track of or how it's storing that information is a really hard thing to learn later on. Uh, but if you can just start out with like, no, this is not just the diagrams, but like this is the diagrams and this is what it represents and this is how the computer will try to convey that information to you. I didn't know where else to put this one, but it's the same thing as git log. It doesn't change anything. It gives you lots of information. You should definitely be teaching git diff on the first day, because otherwise the only way that they know if something is different is going back and looking at previous commits, uh, or like guessing based on like what status told them. Uh, another thing, definitely teach them the difference between just using git diff on its own and git diff with one of the uh, hash name, the name of the commit. Um, Again, normally I don't like adding extra arguments, but those two are both very important to use, uh, so I think you should teach that on day one. All right, so that's the basics of workflow. Um, I would definitely recommend iterating over all of these steps at least twice before moving on to branching or remote repositories. Um, also, you can teach remote repositories and branching in whatever order you want. Uh, there are some upsides to teaching one of them before the other, but it's gonna depend on like what you need them to know right now. But I'm gonna start with remote repositories. <laughs> so, I hate these two commands so much. Um, these, <sighs> all right, here we go. Um, just gonna rant about this for a minute. That's just four words that like you maybe learned one of them earlier in like a tutorial and they're just like, do this, it means something. You won't be able to access that information later because no one's told you about remote show at any point in time. Uh, so that's a really horrifying one. And that dash U is short for set upstream, uh, which 
good luck explaining upstream if you haven't already talked about working with others. This is another time where if you, at the beginning, say like, you're gonna be working with others, there's this structure that's in place to protect you, then like, maybe it'll be easier to explain upstream. Or if you've already talked about branching, there's a lot of stuff that goes into branching that will, it'll be necessary to talk about working with others. So if you teach branching first, upstream is a little easier to explain. Otherwise, you just gotta hope that you really explain like, this is how Git solves the problem of working with others uh, really well at the beginning. Um, so yeah, uh, those are the worst commands ever. Um, <laughs> Uh, another thing I find extremely frustrating is if you want to see a list of your branches, it's git branch. And if you want to see a list of your remotes, it's git remote show. <laughs> they, Git's terrible, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, another thing that I feel like a lot of tutorials don't explain is that you can have multiple remotes. Uh, so that sort of helps with the whole like origin is just a name. And you can have lots of places where you might want to put this in origin is just one of the names. And yes, you have to use it because all the tutorials are assuming that you're using it. But yeah, especially with ones like Heroku where Git is just one of the steps among many, they're not gonna spend much time talking about that. They're just gonna assume you're using origin. Um, so explain them that they can have multiple remotes. Explain that this is just a name of one of them. Uh, you can try to teach them where to find it. I've found that a lot of people do just fine without knowing how to find that. If they're just using GitHub or if they're just working on a group project, you can probably get away with not teaching that right away. All right, um, so you can read these. These are some of the ways to explain them. The main thing I wanted to point out here is um, describing the difference between pull and fetch when you haven't talked about branching can be pretty confusing. So. If you haven't already talked about branching, maybe just teach him one and then hope that by the time you get to branching, you have time to teach him the other one. Uh, otherwise, they're gonna spend a lot of time thinking like, okay, which one do I want here when it probably doesn't matter a whole lot if they're not doing much branching yet. Okay, uh, so I have my issues with GitHub, but it's, it's really easy. So especially with beginners, if you're trying to get them used to remotes, GitHub has so much documentation and every question you could ever ask about GitHub is on Stack Overflow. Uh, so when you're first teaching about remotes, GitHub is probably your best option. Um, one of the problems though is that GitHub has a tendency to encourage you to always use Git in terms of GitHub and it doesn't make a huge distinction between which tools are Git and which ones are GitHub, so you have to do that. Uh, specifically, fork and pull <coughs> requests are not inherent aspects of Git. Um, so yeah, make sure that they understand that distinction because trying to find the man page for fork can be very frustrating. Um, another thing, not all remote repositories insist, or not all of, the other places you can uh, throw a Git repository uh, care about this, but Git won't let you push to something you haven't already made. You have to go make something ideally with the same name and say, yes, this is it. Whereas like sometimes Bitbucket is like, oh yeah, sure, I'll just make that for you while I'm at it. Um, so yeah, the order of the steps, especially if you've just taught Git status add commit push status add commit push, uh, it can be pretty confusing when you're like, why won't it do this? And it's like, oh right, because I didn't even tell it like where to store all this information or set up upstream and origin yet. Um, so yeah. Also, if you started on Git for, or on GitHub first, it will give you the steps for like, here's how you start it here, or here's how you find, you take a repository you've already started yourself and like put it here. So again, so much documentation. Uh, I will warn you though that the GitHub IDE is one of the most confusing. It person I talked to the longest about this who was describing what they like about it, they were saying like it doesn't break down every single little command into its little atoms. It will just do lots of stuff for you together. This might be an ideological thing, but I think having the individual pieces and knowing the difference between like add all, commit, and then push separately is pretty useful in actually understanding like what's going on um, with Git. So I wouldn't use the GitHub ID. It's not great. Mm -hmm. When you're teaching, how much do you have people do in the 
GitHub UI, if they have a choice of doing stuff in their GitHub UI, like little edits and stuff, versus uh, stuff that they would do on the command line? I would heavily. Do you want to repeat the question? Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, so when you have a choice between um, doing something in GitHub or doing it from the command line, which way do you lean towards, should I do little edits on GitHub or should I do them from the command line? Um, I would lean heavily on the command line. Uh, I, my bias is based on like one story. So this is anecdote. This is an anecdote, not data. But I had a friend who was like, yeah, I really know Git and was applying for jobs. And then later on I found out that they were just using the GitHub page and like doing edits on there. They didn't know how to get it to the command line. And I feel like especially if you're applying for jobs, a lot of people are going to assume that when you say you know Git, you know the command line stuff. So I would strongly encourage you to lean more towards the command line. It also eliminates some of the issues of like, I don't remember when the last time I pulled was. Uh, so you should probably treat the remote as like the official copy, but not having to worry, knowing for a fact that all changes were definitely generated from your computer is probably gonna help early on when you're still struggling to remember like what all you need to do. Um, Thank you. But I'm also biased because I just think it's better. I don't have a good reason for that. It's just the way I learned it. Sure, yeah, oh, and definitely as they get farther down the line, like all advanced Git classes or intermediate Git classes, like there's so many ways to do everything and they'll definitely learn all the other stuff later. Uh, and then they can make decisions about uh, what they prefer. Okay. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, because the only way I can think of to protect against that is to add git fetch the beginning of your workflow, which sounds like something you'd easily forget. Um, I will say this though, the git box has one of the better visualizations of what is going on. So if you really really want to give them something visual that will help them understand conceptually what's going on with Git, Git box is pretty good. I still prefer the command line. Um, and also you can draw pictures. You can always draw pictures. Uh, anyway, so Git clone. Um, again, teaching the difference between like what it means to fork and then clone something versus just cloning it directly. Uh, when I first started out on GitHub, I forked everything before I cloned it, even if I had no intention of contributing to it ever. It was just like, I want this code, um, which is so silly. Um, <laughs> I've cleaned most of them out. I think they're all gone now. But yeah, teaching that there's a difference between fork and then clone and just cloning. Uh, again, I've written down basically how you can say it, but there's definitely better ways. Um, but you also have the, difference, the choice between using SSH and HTTP. And this is one of those points where it's like, don't get sidetracked. This is not a good time to talk about SSH key gen. That is, oh, no. <laughs> that's like an extra like three, four steps that does involve like knowing how you prefer to copy from files you don't know how to see. Uh, so you're gonna get sidetracked. There's a finite amount of information they're gonna learn on the first day and this is not what they need to know. Right now we're teaching Git, we're not teaching SSH. And it is really helpful to optimize that later, but that's an optimization. That is not what you need to know on day one. You need to know where you're putting stuff, you need to know that you're logged in as the correct person, and you should probably know what your GitHub password is. So just use HTTP. <laughs> it also saves a lot of time, especially in workshops, if you don't really have to like go through that process and like look over everyone's shoulder. Um, but if they already have their SSH key set up, awesome. Just score. Uh, you can teach them that way, but they probably already know Git if they're that far along. All right, so that's the end of remote repositories. We're on to branching now. Again, you can teach branching before remote repositories depending on what it is you want them to learn. Okay, um, don't teach them graph theory. Um, they don't need to know the formal definition of trees or what is it, directed acyclic graphs, is that right? 
Yeah, they don't need to know that today. Uh, draw some pictures. That's one of the things we've always had right all along, draw pictures. Um, I know some people strongly prefer having just the little arrows in between that says like, this is the parent of this and this is the parent of this one. Honestly, that's something they can learn later. It is really helpful to think of that way and think of it that way, and it's probably really helpful to start thinking of it that way very early on. But day one, like maybe we can just sort of be like, yes, this is a branch. We're not gonna say how like everything in this branch includes when it goes down to the roots or any of that. But uh, yeah, make sure that you're teaching the tree structure. The uh, tree metaphor that's built into Git is really helpful, and a lot of the commands in branching uh, are gonna be. I found uh, are pretty easy to grasp uh, first time around. But again, be careful that you're not using Git incantations. Um, you still have to talk about the structure independently of the metaphor. All right, all these commands are super straightforward, but again, I just wanna say, especially with Git branch, like not a great time to talk about all the different little uh, arguments that you can add on, or the dash things, the options. Uh, that's something they can learn later. They're probably not gonna need to use many of them. Yes, they will need to know how to delete branches, but it's not the end of the world if they have too many branches sitting around. Uh, so I don't think they need to know that on day one. Um, and also this is, again, another one of those weird confusion points that like I didn't anticipate until somebody was confused and asked me a question, but branches aren't subfolders. Uh, yeah, I don't even know like how it was explained to them in a way, and I might have done it. Uh, I might have explained it in a way where it sounded like branches were subfolders. I may have treated it as if they were like a separate project within a project, um, but try to try to head that one off the pass. And yes, I did oh. <laughs> use the word goat to set up for this. I think I promised someone I would put goats in my <laughs> presentation, so here's your goat. There's only the one. Um, so definitely walk through this process though of finding branches and navigating to them uh, and definitely show what happens if you try to check out a branch that doesn't exist. Uh, it's fairly obvious to us what's going on there, but if, you, if they're on a computer that doesn't have highlighting or there's only two branches and they don't know which one is highlighted, uh, I would just walk through them, walk through this with them and do git log between as many steps as possible. Um, so just like origin, master is just the name of something, but you still have to use it. Uh, I think you can name it something else or you can delete it at the very least. Uh, but yeah, master branch is one of those things where it sounds like those words mean something to us because we're so used to using them, um, but it doesn't. It doesn't actually mean something in and of itself. Uh, so make sure you explain master in one of these ways and explain that it is just a name it works exactly like all the other branches. It's just that all the tutorials will assume you're using this word for the good copy or the one that your boss cares about. Okay. Um, so yeah, git merge. Obviously, if you're teaching branching, teach merging on the first day and teach merge conflicts on the first day because they're going to have them all the time. Uh, you're rarely going to have clean merges. So make sure that when you teach merging, pick something that will definitely result in a conflict. Because if you're not there to walk them through, like here's what this error looks like, and then explain how it's really easy to deal with it, they're just gonna see conflict in capital letters and be like, oh God, what happened? Uh, it's fairly easy to Google for, but again, it's one of those problems that's like so entrenched in the language that we're used to that no one really explains it in terms of like, the computer basically just said, I don't know what to do here. Uh, so yeah, there's a bunch of ways to describe a merge conflict. It's two histories that are incompatible, or it's usually just imports that are in the wrong order. Uh, but it is essentially the computer just said, I don't know what to do here, and I need your help. Uh, and like I said, it's usually something super dumb. <laughs> so. Just, I think like when I actually had to teach this for a workshop, I literally just wrote down a bunch of words on different lines and then intentionally, I had them fork the repo and then they just corrected two of them that were not in alphabetical order and then submitted that back and then submitted a pull request. Uh, but definitely walk them through and then I showed them like what the merge conflict was like when they were like, oh, I changed your history and I want you to accept it, this new 
<laughs> this new version of history. Uh, so yeah, it always looks the same. It's very straightforward. It's just a bunch of characters that can't compile, and that's how I'm pretty sure that's how Git finds it. Is it just says like, oh yes, this is broken. Uh, this is a thing I know how to find. It always looks the same. Stupid enough that the computers can find it. So you can just show them like you just have to pick something between here and here. And Git doesn't care as long as you delete those characters. You can keep everything if you want to. Um, but I can't say this enough. Like they're gonna have merge conflicts on any project they ever work on. And just knowing ahead of time that they all look exactly the same will be very helpful. And then as soon as you're done with the merge conflict, show them the history. Show them what Git did with that information. Yeah. Um, how can you explain head on day one? Oh, I forgot. I deleted that. Don't explain head on day one. Uh, you can, you will have to explain it and probably as you get like more in depth with like weirder merging issues um, and especially once they start going back in time. But on day one where you're just showing like here's what you should try to do most of the time and when you're teaching them good practices, like head is a bizarre concept. Um, really great thing to talk about like two weeks in, not a great thing to talk about on day one. Uh, but yeah, if you show them that, you can kind of just be like, that's just a thing, it's always there. I really wouldn't explain head on day one. But you do have to explain it sooner or later. <laughs> um, all right, so also on the subject of things you shouldn't explain, <laughs> this is a list of stuff that, you, please don't talk about this <laughs> uh, on day one. Um, yes, rebase is on there twice. <laughs> I'm really serious about that one, guys. <laughs> um, some of these I've already mentioned, uh, but specifically with rebase and amend and some of the others, uh, it's really helpful to be able to say history is immutable. Git will protect you by never deleting anything. But they're not gonna believe you if you're like, oh my gosh, but there's this really cool way where you can rewrite history. <laughs> and, it, and it might be like, no, no, but it's still protecting you. They're still ref log, but don't, you don't wanna try and have them read ref log on day one. Uh, so yeah, don't explain these. It's okay to lie about rebase. <laughs> um, actually, just in general when teaching, it's okay to lie. Um, so I don't know, how many of you have taken physics? All right, okay. How many of you took physics in high school? And then keep your hand up if you uh, took it in college. All right, so you may have noticed that in high school they're like, this is how gravity works. It always works like this. Look how great Newtonian physics is. And then like day one of college is like, we have no idea how gravity works. But it was important for you to understand Newtonian physics. And it was important that you understood that you could just trust that gravity worked that way. Uh, so with Git, it's important to trust that history, the history will always exist. You can always get back to something that, was bef that you had before. Um, don't tell them that it'll go away. And also, how much trouble are they gonna get, on, get into on their first day? Like, hopefully lots, but like, <laughs> maybe not rebase lots. <laughs> <laughs> also, don't teach graph theory. I got a math degree and did a lot of discrete math, and I know so much about graph theory, and it's painful for me to say that, because I only wanna talk about graph theory all the time. <laughs> and not the useful stuff. I just wanna talk about how Beinecke is insanely smart. Uh, so as someone who loves graph theory, don't talk about graph theory. Um, okay, so I led a PyLadies workshop, and these are just a couple of things I noticed. That's uh, all the stuff for like the Git content, but these are just a couple of things that I've noticed that helped uh, in general. Um, Make sure they have Git installed ahead of time. Like just tell them how or tell them how they can check. Uh, but that's something that takes so much time to deal with on the day. Uh, so do everything you can to make sure that they have it installed ahead of time. Uh, it always takes longer than you think it will to install things. Um, and, and there are Windows users. A lot of beginners are Windows users. Um, uh, no, no, it's not that. Uh, it, <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> um, Git Bash does a few things differently than Git, uh, and it's really weird edge cases. And I wanted to get a picture of what it does when you use Git RM, and I could not. Uh, I could not regenerate the error uh, <laughs> when I got a hold of a friend's uh, Windows machine. But trust me, sometimes, but apparently not always, 
Git bash does really weird things differently. Uh, so I definitely recommend preparing ahead of time and like not trusting that it works the same way. Um, yeah, and I had to teach to a bunch of people and partnered them up. They're gonna ask each other for help anyways. Uh, and then you just have fewer different computers doing different things. So just say, hey, you have the same operating system as this other person, you're partners now. <coughs> Work together on this. Uh, and then if you're teaching an individual, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that they can probably come back to you and ask for questions. So definitely like throw them at a project, get them started on something right away because practice is obviously gonna be better than everything else. Um, and this is true just in general, but if you're pair programming with somebody that's your mentee, let them drive. It doesn't help for them to just say like, I want you to do this and then for you to type the exact correct command that they didn't know the name of. So yeah, with pair programming, definitely have the less experienced person drive. Uh, but one of the problems with that is if you're navigating, it seems like they're taking forever to do little things. You have to be exceptionally patient with that because their wheels are spinning like twice as fast as yours just to understand what's happening. Um, so this is just basic idea of like, just try to keep these things in mind. If nothing else, like keep a copy of this slide next to you when you're teaching. All the rest of it, hopefully you can figure out on your own, but like make sure that you remember these things. And then I don't know what time this talk ends. Cool. <laughs>